As a PC gamer, there are a lot of ways we can get around that pesky upgrading issue. See, one thing we all know about computer people is we have to upgrade every five days. Otherwise, we can't even play the newest indie games. Luckily for us, we have a few workarounds for that little issue, and one of them is called overclocking. But is overclocking worth it? Won't it blow up your computer, and is it safe to do? See, overclocking is one of those really scary things to new computer builders, and I always love messing with people. There was a guy that I worked with at Walmart named Andrew, and I told stories about him before. He would tell me all the time that he knew everything there was to know about computers, and it was kind of annoying because he didn't. Well, one day I brought up overclocking, and his friend said, Hey, yeah, I've heard of that. How can I overclock my computer? Well, I said, all you have to do is remove the CPU, find a static heavy area like a carpet or wool cloth, and rub the CPU gently against it. For every static tick you hear, you've overclocked a full gigahertz, and to reset it, just run it under some warm water. I was a bit of a jerk, but these guys definitely had it coming, and they never had any intention of trying it anyway. See, overclocking can be a very daunting thing, especially for your first time. Not every motherboard has an easy overclocking tool that does everything for you, and most of the time you actually have to go in, set additional voltage, overclock just a little, see if it's stable, wash, rinse, repeat until it's unstable, and then reset to the last stable overclock. And this can and will take a long time. The biggest question is, is all of this really worth said time? Now I may be jumping a bit ahead of myself here, so let me take a step back for those who don't know what overclocking even is and explain it. See, a processor, or RAM, or a graphics card, these things run at a set amount of hertz. One gigahertz is equal to one billion cycles per second, meaning that every second, electrons are traveling from point to point to send information in the form of waves to their destination. The faster the electrons move, the faster the information can be utilized, so in theory, the higher a CPU is clocked, the faster information can travel. With this in mind, you may be wondering, well, why doesn't everyone just overclock then? And this is where we get into the ethics of the whole thing. Let's start with processors as they tend to be the most common component to overclock. You always hear horror stories like overclocking can blow up your computer if you do it wrong, and this one is a myth. See, it's actually very difficult to break your components by overclocking them. The most common obstacle people run into is setting the voltage too high, and then their computer just keeps boot cycling. Just turning off and on forever, and though clearing the CMOS is annoying, that's kind of all you have to do to fix the issue. Most motherboards today actually come with a BIOS refresh switch just in case this happens to you. So even if you do fail, it's only a couple seconds of work to get everything back to the way it was and try again. See, boot cycles can happen when the CPU is getting too hot so the computer shuts down to save its life. There's no harm in a computer boot cycling even forever because none of the components are actually getting warm enough to start degrading. So if this ever happens to you while you're overclocking, don't get discouraged. Trust me, it happens to everybody. Now you might say, well Barry, you talked about hardware degradation a second ago. Is that something I should be worried about if I overclock? And this is probably the largest thing to consider. When it comes to practically any component in your PC, the biggest enemy is heat. The hotter your hardware is for the longest amount of time, the less lifespan that component will have. So for those of you who are thinking of overclocking and using a stock cooler from the manufacturer, you may want to take a second and rethink that. I always recommend liquid cooling as it's very affordable and will keep your overclock components cooler than anything else on the average consumer market. Aftermarket air coolers work too, but as a preference, I just always use liquid. Especially since a lot of them are around the same price as an aftermarket air cooler, but back to the topic of degradation. Yes, an overclocked CPU, even using a liquid cooler, will more likely than not have a lower lifespan. However, it's not as short as you might think. Taking a CPU clocked at 3.5 GHz stock and using it until it dies naturally may take 15 to 20 years. Taking the exact same CPU and overclocking it to 4.0 GHz may shorten its life to 8 to 10 years. And for someone like me who likes to upgrade every couple generations, 8 to 10 years isn't an amount of time that I'm going to be too worried about. The biggest thing to worry about though is resale value. If you overclock your GPU, your RAM, your processor, don't expect to sell it for the same amount as someone selling the exact same component that's never been overclocked. That's just a no-brainer. But as big as an issue as heat is, there are a few other things you may want to think about before overclocking, such as power consumption. See, overclocking will require extra voltage, and this is the part that's very daunting to a lot of people. My largest recommendation for people is before you buy a PC, if you know you want to overclock, think about getting a motherboard that sports an overclocking tool. These things are really easy to use, they're safe, and they adjust all the numbers for you. However, if you don't have a board with a function like this, please do take your time to research the board you have. Find a good starting spot and work your way up slowly. Go as far as you can whilst keeping the overclock stable, i.e. no blue screens, no artifacting or crashing, games are playing well, and your PC of course is not boot cycling. Also make sure that you're not overclocking to a point that your power supply can't handle, because when those things go, they like to take crap with them. Trust me, I lost a pretty good liquid cooler to one of those kamikaze cubes. Now you may be wondering, well Barry, what would you recommend as a good starting point for my CPU? And this is quite a problem. See, every single CPU is unique, and I don't mean every generation of them. 
The Silicon Lottery is very much a thing, and what I mean by that is someone could have a brand new Intel CPU clocked at 3.5 GHz, and it'll let him overclock to 5.7 with not a lot of extra voltage and a manageable amount of heat, whilst another person with the same Intel CPU wouldn't even be able to overclock theirs past 3.6 without getting it too hot. Each processor has design flaws within any part of the chip that can and will affect its performance above a certain clock speed, which is why manufacturers pick a very safe speed at which to clock them. While in all honesty, most CPUs on the market are hiding a lot of extra power that you could have access to in a few minutes and be totally fine forever. It just depends on where you land within the silicon lotto, and while I'm talking about manufacturers, most manufacturers will not offer any sort of warranty for broken parts that were overclocked because of this very reason. So if you are overclocking and you try to go crazy with it, keep that in mind. Now I want to talk about GPUs for a second before I get into my overclocking story. GPUs are much different overclockers than CPUs in that a child of any age could overclock them. See, programs that are hardware specific and designed around your motherboard use the BIOS to get an idea of what's safe. Meaning, if your overclocking software has a scroll bar that moves to the left and right, moving that all the way to the right won't actually hurt your GPU. Because your motherboard is locked it off to a point where you only have access to safe points. Now, you can of course download software that will get around that, and that in itself is on you. But programs like Asus GPU Tweak 2 and EVGA Precision XOC will almost never let you overclock your GPU to a point that you can do any damage. Even still, I would be careful and maybe think about some aftermarket liquid cooling if you want to do some crazy clocking. Now you may have noticed that I haven't touched on overclocking RAM yet, and this is for a few reasons. See, unlike CPUs, both RAM and GPU's clock speed is calculated in megahertz, which is equal to 1 million cycles per second. This means they overclock a bit differently, but I also didn't touch on them because it's important to my story. When I was working at Falcon, I decided to purchase a Ryzen 7 1700 CPU as reviews boasted that it could be overclocked past the 1800X, which, for a $200 CPU, is pretty impressive. I also got myself a motherboard that supported an easy overclocking tool just in case, but the stock tool wasn't going to let me go as high as I wanted to. After a few hours of adjusting, the overclock just wasn't stable and I actually took the computer to my boss a few times to see if he could help. After a couple days, he came back with the same issue and we had to wait for a BIOS update before the overclock could be stable. After a few weeks, Asus came out with an update and things were looking up. We overclocked my RAM and CPU way past the 1800X and everything was great. Except, my computer ran slower. Now I don't know about you guys, but when I overclocked my PC, I want the opposite to happen. I couldn't understand what the issue was until I looked at my hardware monitor and found out that even though I'd overclocked the memory, it had actually cut the speed in half. So instead of 3000 MHz, I was at 1500. Well that's a problem, I thought, and I set the RAM back to its factory speed in hopes that that would help. Nope, the RAM was still cut in half, and at that point, I would have had to set the RAM to two times its stock clock to get it to run at my desired speed. Now why did this happen? Well, it turns out Asus had a bit of an issue with its overclocking the new Ryzen chips, so when you overclock the CPU, it cut the RAM speed in half, and if you really wanted to overclock the RAM, you'd have to keep the processor at stock. So I had to wait until a proper BIOS update came out before I could actually get the speed that I wanted. And no, it's not an oh crap my computer blew up kind of thing, but it's definitely something to think about if you build a new computer for overclocking in mind. Now back to the original question, is overclocking worth it, and to me it most certainly is. Overclocking has gotten easier and easier, manufacturers are making CPUs with overclocking in mind, you can almost never damage these components doing so so long as you're not being stupid about it, and even the most crazy overclocks typically won't degrade your components enough to matter over time. Plus they give a lot of options to those out there who can't afford to upgrade. Simply boost your CPU, RAM, and GPU a little bit and it's practically an upgrade in itself. If you're still weary about it, that's okay, but learning as much as you can about your specific model can do a lot for you. I guess the biggest issue is fighting the silicon lotto. If you end up with a CPU that doesn't really overclock well, that would really suck, and most of the time you can get a new one. Silicon is such a strange element too, and it's used in so many things. Electronics, solar panels, high-powered lasers, breast implants, and typically the same rules apply for all. The hotter they are, the more likely they won't last.